Sakara and its mastabas from the late Old Kingdom. Today I'll show you some of my favorites, the tombs of the viziers of Pharaoh Titi, who during his long reign struggled with political and social crises. So I'll take you to the mastabas from the 6th dynasty, when climate change shook the once all-powerful empire. These were troubled times for Egypt, times of intrigue, palace coups and political crimes. You'll see rare footage of the beautiful mastabas of Egyptian lords from four and a half thousand years ago. Although more magnificent than ever before, they foreshadow the fall of the Pyramid Age. Before we start our new adventure, please subscribe to my channel to help me continue my journey through ancient sites. Let's go! Near the southern wall of the Djoser pyramid complex is our first tomb, although Mehu was only the sixth, perhaps the last vizier of Pharaoh Titi, the first king of the sixth dynasty, he began building his tomb during the time of the previous ruler, hence the location of his mastaba in the vicinity of the so-called cemetery of Unas. This is an exceptional tomb, perfectly preserved, in fact, the best of all that we've seen in Saqqara so far. Most of the carved scenes have retained their colors, perhaps because after the discovery of the tomb in 1940 by Egyptian archaeologists, it remained closed to visitors for another 80 years, until 2019. The most characteristic element of the tomb is the false door in the cult chapel of Mehu. They are perfectly preserved, probably the best in the whole of Saqqara. The paint that covered the limestone is supposed to imitate red granite. Carefully carved yellow painted hieroglyphs give the false door a particularly elegant character. They look as if they were painted yesterday and not thousands of years ago. Next to the traditional guardian of the dead, Anubis, we see the name of Osiris, who in the times of Mehu was already becoming a national deity. The perfectly preserved ceiling was also painted to imitate granite, which, as we know, was reserved only for gods and pharaohs. Among Mehu's 60 titles, the most important were Chief of Justice and Vizier. He was also Governor of the region, Supervisor of the Treasury House, and probably a member of the royal family related to both Unas and Titi. More original colors mean more information for historians, who have identified, among others, many species of birds bred in Egypt at that time, all thanks to the faithful rendering of plumage by ancient painters. Another important element visible only thanks to the preserved paint is the moustache, quite common among the Egyptians of the Old Kingdom.
In the antechamber we see a large image of Mehu, accompanied by his wife, Princess Neferkawas, king's daughter of his body. From here we can get to the second cult chapel, that was probably intended for Mehu's son, Merer Ang. He was also supposed to have been a vizier, probably under Pepi I, who came to the throne after the short rule of Userkare, a usurper, who may have been responsible for Teti's death. According to the 3rd century BC Ptolemic historian Maneto, Teti was executed by his own courtiers. So Pepi I Meriref, the son of the assassinated Titi, became the third king of the Sixth Dynasty, and his new vizier took the name Merireang, in honor of the new pharaoh, as was common practice at the time. Such change of names don't facilitate the work of Egyptologists. We don't know which of Mehu's sons became Merireang. In these troubled times of crisis in Egypt, viziers changed frequently. Influential aristocratic families competed with each other for power, a power that the highest officials had more and more of as the king's position weakened. This is one of my favorite mastabas. Everything around us is original, not reconstructed like in many others. It's not easy to film in these very narrow corridors. They were built to be covered by short, therefore durable, roof slabs. The architect's idea was successful. These beautiful reliefs survived almost intact to our times. On the eastern side of this narrow corridor is the entrance to a vast open courtyard, unfortunately almost completely destroyed today. It was here that the shaft leading to Mehu's burial chamber was found. This part of the mastaba was usurped by another son of Mehu, Hotep Ka, who built his own chapel here. We can see his false door, painted with characteristic red spots, which were intended to imitate the coarse-grained structure of red granite. Only a small fragment of the chapel wall has survived to our times. Of course, the walls of the mastaba are decorated with scenes of agricultural activities, the harvesting of abundant crops, successful fishing and the catching of waterfowl in nets. But in reality, these were difficult times for the Egyptians. According to many researchers, much more dangerous than the political crisis was the progressive weakening of their only river to which Egypt owed its existence, its success. Towards the end of the Old Kingdom, the power of floods decreased radically. The low Nile brought less sediment, leading to drought and crop failures, which inevitably led to the fall of the empire. Let us bear this in mind when visiting the next tombs. In the immediate vicinity of Mehu's tomb, we come across several mastabas, including the mastaba of the daughter of Pharaoh Unas, Idut, built in the times of Teti with the famous scene of a hippopotamus giving birth, the tomb of Unas' son, Unas Ang. The walls were cut down and taken to Chicago in America and reconstructed there, so not much remains. Equally badly damaged is the tomb of the royal prince, Inefert, also from the time of Unas. 
To visit another tomb of a vizier from the early 6th dynasty, we must go to Teti's Cemetery, near his pyramid, about a kilometer to the northwest. In one of my previous episodes, I showed you the largest private mastaba of Saqqara, belonging to Teti's powerful third vizier, Mararuka. A link to the film in the description. Before I take you to the mastaba of another of Teti's viziers, Kagemni, let's take a look at the neighboring tomb of the mysterious Nefer Seshemptach, who, according to some scholars, was supposed to become vizier. I had to show you this spectacular falls door. Quite unique with life-size statues cut into both outer jams. The bust of the deceased, carved into the central panel of the door, probably presented a naturalistic portrait of the official. Deliberately vandalized, as you can see, perhaps immediately after Nefer Seshemptar's death. The beginning of the 6th dynasty brought social and political disturbances. We know that during Teti's reign the tombs of some of his courtiers were being destroyed. The new pharaoh of unclear origins had to contend with opposition from powerful Memphite families, who had inherited main state offices since the 5th dynasty. Teti, therefore, formed alliances by arranging political marriages. He had many daughters, most of them named Sesheshet, probably in honor of his mother. His viziers, such as Kagemni and Mararuka, entered the royal family in this way. Nefer Seshemptah also married one of Seshashets, hence the conclusion that he was prepared for the role of vizier, which he never became. Perhaps he was assassinated by his rivals, as was the case with Pharaoh Titi himself, who was also to become the victim of a palace conspiracy after 30 years of difficult and turbulent rule. At that time, the pharaohs built their pyramids relatively small, and as you can see, they were also quite poorly constructed. But the mastavas of nobles, especially viziers, serving as prime ministers and chief justice, were built in a big way. The best example, the mastaba of Kagemni, one of the largest ever built in Saqqara. Kagemni was absolutely not a man of Teti whom he would place in the position of vizier as his acolyte, but rather a powerful and seasoned politician who had been building his position for decades. The tomb's inscription inform us that he performed important functions at the court already in the times of Pharaoh Jetkara Isesi, and in the times of Unas he was already the great chief a nomarch administering one of the 42 provinces of Egypt. Kagemni governed the province of Nekhan, the third nome of Upper Egypt, the famous ancient Heraconpolis. In those times, the nomarchs were no longer just royal representatives of the gnomes, but increasingly independent, feudal lords. The progressive decentralization of power during the 6th dynasty would ultimately lead to the break-off of the nomarchs with the palace and the disintegration of the state, which would occur approximately 100 years after Kagemni's death. Kagemni managed the empire's finances, royal residences, officials, and generally all the works of the king. Teti entrusted him with the construction and administration of his funerary complex, his pyramid, then called the Places of Teti, are enduring. Kagemni was the high priest of Heliopolis, 
the then most influential religious center in the entire country with the temple of Atum Ra. He was also the priest of Min and Anubis. A truly unique scene. One of the farmhands feeds a young pig from his own mouth. Pigs were almost never depicted in reliefs because they were generally considered unclean. As you can see, only the lower registers of the walls have survived to this day. They must have been buried under sand when the mastaba was attacked by stone robbers, probably in ancient times. Although the structure was almost completely dismantled, the surviving reliefs are impressive in their attention to detail. And here are dancers, acrobats entertaining their vizier. It's one of the largest mastabas of Saqqara. It's built on a square plan with sides 32 meters long. It contains eight large chambers and extensive storerooms. The further into the mastaba we go, the better preserved the walls of the chambers we encounter. Reliefs have survived here even in the highest registers. We are in the main cult chamber, with a false door, in front of which the deceased's relatives made offerings and recited inscriptions carved on the door. The soul of the vizier reached for food through a narrow opening painted here orange the open part of the door which suggests a roller on its top. Up in the middle you can see semi-cylindrical drum. This was the imitation of the real reed mats that were used to close the actual doors of ancient Egyptians. Something like a modern roller blind. In this chamber, instead of presenting motives from everyday life, the focus is on the posthumous cult, primarily on making offerings to Kagemni, feeding his ka. Bringing slaughtered animals, fowls and all kinds of plants, which are from his cities and villages of eternal possession, all the servants of the eternal good, in the new year, on the Wag festival, on the Feast of Tol, of the first day of the year, Feast of Sokar, the Great Fire, and the sacrifices on Feasts of the New Year and Full Moons, and on every Feast of the Chief Judge and Vizier, Kagemni. The last deepest eighth chamber with its colorful reliefs is the best preserved. Here we can look into the face of Kagemni, who proudly walks amidst a procession of servants bearing offerings to his ka. This part of the soul was given special attention in the Old Kingdom, enchanted in the statue of the deceased placed in a hidden secret special chamber. Ka was his spiritual double maintaining the life force. The Egyptians believed that Ka came into being at the moment of creation, when Atum gave birth to Shu and Tefnut, air and moisture, and embraced them, passing on his life force. The hieroglyphic symbol of Ka is therefore two arms connected together, as if reaching for food to sustain the deceased Ka. Offerings of incense, oils and live animals were also made to Ka. Ritual slaughter, especially of bulls, released a lot of energy, which was absorbed by the Ka. When the deceased was forgotten and no offerings were made to him, the only hope remained in the reliefs, which were also supposed to somehow sustain this mysterious spiritual power.
As you can see, scenes of processions with offerings dominate the mastaba. The closer to the exit, the more free the subject of the reliefs becomes, so to speak. Everywhere, however, we come across images of Kagemni, much larger than the other figures. This symbolizes his higher rank, as do the attributes he holds in his hands. The scepter Sekhem symbolizes authority. The word Sekhem itself literally means power. We also often see the vizier with a staff in one hand and with a folded cloth in the other. This refers to two hieroglyphic symbols, which when put together mean official. It's not surprising, therefore, that in almost all mastabas of high officials we find very similar representations. A beard and a long wig are obligatory attributes of a nobleman. When he wears a short wig, or no wig at all, he's distinguished by a diadem with a long ribbon fastened with a bow. The so-called heart amulets appear at the end of the Old Kingdom and refer to the young Osirian beliefs as a symbol of the justification of the soul in the judgment of Osiris. The inscription on the façade of the Mastaba reads The Majesty of Titi, my Lord, he who lives eternally, named me as the head of all offices on the service at any hour at their residence. His Majesty had confidence with regarding all things which His Majesty had ordered to be done, because I was capable, because I was appreciated by His Majesty. The Mastaba was discovered in 1843 by the Prussian archaeologist Richard Lepsius, making it one of the first discoveries in Tetis Cemetery. The adjacent huge Mastaba of Kagemni's successor, the Vizia Mereruka, was discovered 50 years later. The next Vizier of Titi was Ankh Mahor. The scarce remains of his mastaba contain a famous relief, a scene of circumcision. We know that this procedure was practiced already in the Old Kingdom. The earliest written document attesting to the circumcision, however, comes from the first intermediate period. We don't know if it was a common practice, but we know for sure that it was popular among Egyptian elites. In contrast to, for example, the Hebrews, circumcision wasn't performed on infants, but on youths entering manhood, and it was most likely not religiously motivated. Since circumcision was practiced in Syria over 5,000 years ago, it's possible that this fashion came to Egypt from the north. As evidence, it's pointed out that the Egyptian word for foreskin has Semitic roots. On the other hand, however, Analysis of male mummies shows that Egyptian procedures differed significantly in technical terms from those practiced by Asiatics. Forgive me for sparing you the details. Perhaps these traditions developed independently. I leave you with this thought. I hope that I managed to tell you a little about the history of Egypt during Teti's times. I've explored his pyramid before, you can find a link to the video in the description. Thank you for watching. If you enjoy our historical adventures and want to help me continue this, please join my Patreon community, link below this video. Please like, comment and share my video with your friends. I'd like to thank all the supporters of my channel, especially my dear patrons. Thanks to you, I can create new content. Also, thanks to all of you who sent me super thanks here on YouTube. And if you're new here, I recommend you to watch my videos from other ancient sites as well as my podcasts about ancient Egyptian beliefs and history. Last but not least, don't forget to subscribe to my channel to be up to date with the new episodes. Thanks again and see you on another ancient site!